how to adopt a wildlife relic. Roy is on a Swedish driven hunt finding out from gun shops and landowners the benefits of boar. The, the possibility to hunt has been a huge, massive increase with the wild boars. Dave the Dog Templar is back with more gun dog training tips. I enjoy running them, it's a bit like racing a Ferrari, so I get the adrenaline rush out of it. Deborah Hadfield investigates game farming and whether they can produce the birds we want for the next pheasant shooting season. But I'm very pleased at the moment there seem to be less cases of avian flu about, so we're going to go for it. We're giving away a knife from ADG Custom Knives. David is on the new stump and James Marchington has hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. or sow. Make a mistake and it could lead to a 1,000 euro fine. 10,000 euros of fines if you shoot a row. Tough love makes for tough but selective hunting. Essential if your large game is as important as your crops or your forestry. Here on this estate in southern Sweden, game is valued. They study the animals here, understand their behaviour and follow the science. We'll explore this management strategy later with Roy, who's here for two days of hunting with aimpoint red dot sights and ticker rifles. We're going to be doing a little bit of uh, pheasant shooting in a couple of days time, so uh, I think it's pheasants and ducks which is scaring the life out of me with the amount of avian influenza about so uh, I'm gonna, <laughs> you're, you're, gonna be seeing, you're gonna be seeing me in the field in a, in a boiler suit or maybe a hazmat suit we're gonna be doing some shooting with the rifle within the cinema make sure we're brushed up yeah it's been a, a couple of years since you know David's taken me out I mean he's you know he's, he's left me in storage for a little while for, for any foreign trip so I'm a, I'm a, I'll probably be a little bit rusty so um, yeah, we need we need to be taken out. So uh, you know, we've done the shooting cinema before. Sorry, we've we done the shooting cinema before. I have done the shooting cinema a couple of times before. Yeah, I enjoy the cinema. So, uh, they're good fun, but I prefer it outside when you've got the uh, the moose targets and uh, you know you can have a have a little bit more of a true representation. I feel. Let's start at the subterranean range at Aimpoint HQ. Roy has a ticker on loan. He also has a selection of aftermarket ticker accessories so he can set it up just how he wants it. And just in case you didn't know, Roy is one of the best aimpoint shooters in the world. No joke. Roy is one of them. Incredible. We have arrived in Sweden and on arrival, as very often happens, you get given a rifle and it doesn't fit. Yeah, it's, it's been set up for somebody else or it's a certain size, it's, it's whatever you get. And this is why I really like the Tikas, obviously, one, I'm familiar with them, yeah, I've been, been shooting Tikas for years. But the other thing now is they come with a whole boatload of different accessories. I can adjust the rifle to suit me, so obviously in the UK we've not been overly fussed about the fit of the rifle. But obviously when we are now doing more driven game shooting, then having a rifle that fits and having the ergonomics of the rifle feeling correct for you does become a lot more important. Everything that you do wants to become smooth, silky and second nature. On the rifle here, we've fitted a larger palm swell and I'm going to play with a, a fatter forend on the rifle that we're going to be using so we're using an enlarged forend just so you've got better grip when you're coming up and it just allows you to swing through that little bit easier and again obviously we've got the cheek piece adjustments on these ones as well so we can we can fit the rifle to exactly what I want and, and so tomorrow when we start the hunt the rifle comes up I'm comfortable with it and it's it's fitted to exactly what I need. So obviously you've got all the, the wild boar kit here. With all on song, yeah, we've arrained a visit a to a Swedish gun shop. The, the reason? This country has seen a shift in hunting culture thanks to the arrival and proliferation of wild boar. With hot spots in England, plus reports suggesting Scotland is on the brink of a population explosion, we want to see what UK gun shops will look like in the next few years. Our business, it's been a huge difference in the, in the last 20 years. The, the commercial thing has been growing like hell. 
when we started off, often you know you had one set of clothing for all hunting. Today yeah. it's not like that. It's a lot about the dog handler one day, and then you're on the stand. Yeah. You move more, and also this is a lot to to, to the wild boar. Of course, also with the increasing uh, game population that we have. Is it tame? Yeah, it's a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when we began, uh, people they started off with buying a shotgun. Yep. Today, the first they'd buy is a rifle. Oh, really? Yeah, it is, definitely. Okay. Uh, and it's also the opportunity to hunt is bigger on the wild boars. You can have a smaller uh, amount uh, area to hunt, and you have the possibility to hunt, and, and uh, also uh, you feed them in, and you sit yeah, yeah. on the, on the night time and, and hunt. So the the possibility to hunt has been a massive. huge, massive increase with the wild boars. It's not all plain sailing for the boar in Sweden. Night vision and thermal are having an impact. Plus, we learn a surge in salmonella is hitting the population hard. The salmonella is really bad, and there's been all over Sweden in some regions, more or less. Okay. Yeah. The yearlings and the, those, they so are it's, gone. It's, it's all the litters that it's. It is small. Yeah, the day after, when the stripes go out, after yeah. 30 to 70 weeks, we can see the die. With a better understanding of the Swedes' relationship with wild boar, Roy had better get some trigger time after a well-deserved wild boar appetizer and fallow venison burger. Oh man, that is superb. The Oh Dear Smash burger van is parked up outside another impressive gun shop. This one has a shooting cinema where Aimpoint's training manager Eric Ars will teach these distributors and retailers from Northern Europe the way of the Aimpoint. The goal for everybody in here should be that if you can pick up one thing that you can bring from this session and then maybe implement into your own shooting or to the customers, then I'm really happy because then you have learned at least one thing during these three hours that we are doing. Now, earlier we made the bold statement that Roy is one of the best shooters Aimpoint has ever seen. Flabbergasted David asks Eric to explain. Eric, you were just explaining what Roy was doing at, um, at the range, which was maybe slightly different to other people. Just explain what you meant. Not slightly different, but uh, slightly better for one oh, thing. Huh? Okay. So what Roy did is that uh, he kept his focus here all the time. When we went up to the contact uh, with the red dot in the middle of the moose, he placed his focus point here. And then he took a decision that he should pull the trigger when he passed his focus point. So he got the focus there, the red dot is there. He keep the focus at the center of the kill zone all the time. And when he passed the focus point, boom, he pulled the trigger. And normally I get all people up to roughly 50 meters to shoot that way. But uh, Roy came up to 70 meters with his way of focus and this movement that he had. And that is quite uncommon, boom, that you actually can reach 70 meters and still have your kill shots inside a kill zone. Okay, so what, why is he able to do that? Uh, he's slightly different than all others. So I think that's just, just the reason. Is that just a superpower? I don't know if it's a superpower or it's a laser power, but uh, he actually get it working really well. Okay, but that means the, the swing is, is better? Or? Uh, uh, we don't call it swing, we say uh, controlled movement, and he has a really good controlled movement when he runs the gun forward. Okay, so what percentage of people would go back to 70 meters? I think I only had uh, three or four guys during the years that have been able to do that. Really? Yeah, Roy is one of them. Incredible. And he's British. Were the other two guys British? Uh, no, no. Not a chance. Lupton <laughs> <laughs> flying the flag. It's all that practice with an air rifle and remote controlled cars with pictures of pigs on top of them. The following morning we are hunting. We only have today on the deer and boar, so we're hoping the gods are with us. Sten Eriksson's family has owned this estate for nearly 800 years, so he knows what makes this place tick. He has already explained what we can't shoot and the financial penalties if we do. However, the team of guns is allowed one metal fallow buck between us. Even that will require some skill. Roy gets set up with his accessorised ticker, Sacco Powerhead Blade Bullets and Aimpoint Acro C2. 
looking really, really good. We had to be a little bit careful coming in. And as we were coming in, we disturbed a few fallow deer, which went out behind. But yeah, I've got a feeling this could be a really, really good spot. So we'll get ensconced, get David up here and see what we can find. Fallow trickle through within minutes of us arriving on the stand. Catches us out a bit, but Roy recovers. We were definitely not on point on that one. I swung through on the first form because obviously you take the form first before you take the doe. I don't know what happened, but obviously I didn't get contact. So it'll be going to be interesting to see. Just look through the footage on the first shot, and then another form ran back right to left, and I shot that one. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, it's going to be very interesting to see what happened on the first one, not quite sure. Unfortunately, we don't know either, as David was following the lead doe and not the fawn. Never mind, the next encounter is clinical. Then comes to mock the game for the trackers, plus asks how many animals Roy has seen. These guys love data. Data is very important for you, isn't it? Data, is that, yeah. Is that because that's the way your brain works or is that just something that you feel is important? We feel it's important, it's, otherwise it's just guesswork. So, you, I mean, a lot of estates, do you think, are, are taking it as seriously as you? Yeah, those who've got game keepers or game wardens take it seriously. Right. We try to point out for the, for the forestry, for the agriculture, success of the hunt. The benefit of all. Benefit of all. Benefit for the forestry, benefit the farmers and the benefit the game. Yeah. <laughs> the coffee break is a welcome chance to warm up and Roy gets some tips on where to put the disposable hand warmers to keep your blood flowing. No, I mean you were saying when we um, when we arrived a good way of keeping your, your shooting hands warm is, yeah. uh, is putting those there and obviously you're, you're, yeah. you're adopting the same technique as well. Yeah, I learned it from Peter, yeah. Okay. So uh, it's one of the, it has an adhesive here, so it's, it, it's actually it's made for putting inside your shoes. Okay. So, but I put put it here yeah. uh, according to your instructions Yeah. and uh, now we'll see how, how hot my hands get. Yeah. It doesn't actually stick because I'm, I'm so greasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is I, I have double action, so when I stand on the, on the, on the high seat I stand like this also. Yeah, yeah. These, with these in my pocket and then you don't freeze with your hands yeah, because yeah. these are the tools you're going to need to actually produce a, a good shot Job. So, yeah uh, for me it's very important this hand i need to keep warm because otherwise i don't i can't feel the trigger as right as well. uh, so i work a lot to try to keep this warm but and, you, if, and you never use gloves I try not to. On this on this hand, I use gloves because this hand I I I, I, uh, I spot with the binoculars. Uh, but with this hand, I usually keep it inside, and then right before I'm going to shoot, I, I put it on the right. Coming out, yeah. yeah. Uh, or pull it out. Yeah, pull it out. Do you have any other tricks at all, Peter? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's an amazing show pony. Uh, lo uh, long stockings are quite, uh, yeah. you know, uh, they're, they're quite nice. Uh, but yes. I won't go into more te details than that. <laughs> tricks for the trades. Very <laughs> secret. Very, <laughs> very, very secret. <laughs> we, have, we have seen his stockings and uh, he is very fetching. <laughs> We've obviously got a stand. We've got a fairly good trail coming through. So there's a lot of fallow deer that have already crossed through this way this morning. So by the looks of it, unfortunately though, the way the tracks are going, they've already left the drive. The next stand is far more open. With two animals already, Roy is doing well. First it's fallow, which are skylined and passed between us and our neighbour. Next, it's Roe. There are 20,000 euros of fines right there. What a shot that would be. But it's a girl, no pizzle. You want it? 
As a consolation prize, a young pig comes along a line below us. A few minutes later, a fallow pricket does the same. Now what is that? David. Just before the horn blows, another wild boar heads over the fields. Hmm? It's difficult to sex them, especially at range. Our last stand of the day is one we filmed Tim on before. There we saw lots. With any luck, Roy will continue to have game pass by. There's still a chance of that metal fallow, which is a good job as Roy has a couple in his sights. That's hit that twice. Now, it is not often the telepathic connection between David and Roy fails. David stays on the first buck while Roy is targeting the second, bigger buck. The Gen 2 shot cam saves the day. Roy puts in a second shot to make sure. That was a stunning, stunning buck. Um, absolutely gorgeous. He just came through there. Um, we saw them back in the wood, um, but it was unsighted as to what quality it was. We're only allowed to take one very good buck on the hunt. So obviously, you want to make sure that it is the type of quality that they're after. Um, and that was a, a lovely, lovely buck. To complete the day, he takes a fallow calf close to where the buck fell. And we can be very happy with our lot. All done, Mr Lupton. Yeah, just received notice over the radio that we are done. So that is the end of our piggy and fallow trip. So um, yeah, that'll be a fabulous day. As I say, we had a, a, a fantastic fallow buck on this one. Um, and we also had a fallow fawn as well. We had a, a couple of other Gosh, opportunities you know, there, there. with the deer running through here. But as the I say, we chose not to take those They're because the beaters had gone in the woodland just behind us. For safety's sake, you've always got to be aware of what's going on around you. So didn't even raise the gun on those. Um, but yeah, it's been absolutely fabulous. It is a phenomenal place. You know, the biggest thing that I always take home from my trips to Sweden is just how good, you know, the management techniques are and the completely different viewpoint to, to wildlife and to game management than we seem to have with our political groups in the UK at the moment. Yeah, for a, a wild fallow buck, he is absolutely stunning. Just, yeah, a superb animal. He obviously lost a bit of condition in the rut. Yeah, Sten knows his fellow um, very well and he's sort of aging him around about seven or eight years old. Just testament to the, you know, the fantastic management that goes on here yeah, and, the, and the abundance of game that Sten has got. I can't grip around it there. Now, one thing we are keen to discuss is his willingness to allow forestry and deer to coexist. As well as sacrificial planting, he also coats his saplings with a lanolin-based product called Trico, and it's proved incredibly successful. You mix it up like a toothpaste. So you just have a bucket and a glove, and you pass every plant and just do like that with your hand, and you apply it. And the proof of the pudding is there, because obviously the top shoot is, is there and intact. Yeah. That's Do you know if they use this in the UK at all, Stan? 
I don't know, but it should be using. You've got sheep, so Trico does the trick, repels all deer chewing on them. Before we end, Roy wants to chat more with Sten, who has collaborated with academics in Sweden, and the data is fascinating. We think about sometimes the game a bit like water, don't fight it too much, but try to control it and, and lead it where it does the least damage or the most good. You know, you were saying that um, when they were doing the study on the, um, a group of red stags in a yeah. particular area, because you had so many people that were walking, walking dogs, yeah. cycling, in that area, then it was pushing all of the stags into a particular part of the forest. Yeah, there was about a thousand hectares of uh, forest. We saw that all the reds were standing in a 150 hectare part of the woods. So they parked there from dusk to dawn, and the government owned, they said no loose dogs, all dogs on leash, and you're not allowed to leave the roads because they can see where they hang out during the day, that's the most damage. If you, if you manage where your people walk, if you manage your footpaths, if you manage making sure that people are walking their dogs on leads, yeah. then... Th then you're starting to have the reds to move around in daylight, to start grazing in a large area, they can uphold. So, that is, you can have a quite high number of reds and fallow deers if you can spread them out. We came to Sweden for some exceptional hunting and hospitality, and also to learn. Hunting is respected here. Hunting is understood here and they have the science to back that up. Maybe that's where we need to be heading. Knowledge is power, and since Covid we've all learned that we have to follow the science. To follow the boar, you'll need an Aimpoint Acro C2, and to follow Roy's example, you'll need a ticker with an accessory kit. Links to all of those below, or you can find them on Kit Finder. Thank you, Roy, and everyone who took part in that film. Now, as you know, we like to be at the cutting edge. So, no surprise that this week's prize is a knife. See what I did there? ADG Custom Knives has made a lovely Field Sporter XL knife, a larger version of the original Field Sporter knife named after this show, and a more general purpose blade that's as much bushcraft as shooting and stalking. Plus, Dean, the maker, will engrave it for you. If you'd like to know how to enter the draw, watch the Field Sports Nation Zone TV show Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays, and you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation for a fiver a month. Now, from dashing blades to bashing Dave, it is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The Ministry of Defence has gone to war with Antis. A leaked letter reveals that the MOD has removed its memorandum of understanding with the League Against Cruel Sports, which allowed Antis to monitor trail hunts. The Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, took to Twitter to say soldiers are the only people who should be masked and camouflaged on Ministry of Defence land. He also states that those who intimidate and threaten people are not welcome on land owned by the government. The memorandum dates back to 2009 under the then Labour government. An English hunt has cleaned up graffiti left by Sabs. A team of volunteers organised by the Menel and South Staffs Hunt scrubbed off the abuse painted on a bridge which runs across a reservoir in Staffordshire. Both sides of the bridge had been daubed with anti-hunting slogans. The graffiti was discovered on Boxing Day on the bridge, which is near where the Menel hunt meets at Blythefield Hall. The Countryside Alliance called the vandalism an attack on the local community and urged anyone with information to contact the relevant authorities. Criminal damage of any kind is simply unacceptable and this behaviour reflects incredibly badly on the anti-hunting activists who thought this horrendous act of vandalism was a good idea. We just hope that anybody with any information will come forward so that those responsible are held to account. Basque is concerned over the potential increase in cost of firearms licensing applications in Scotland. A report by the Scottish Affairs Committee is calling for people who use firearms for recreation to pay the full cost of the applications, but it says anyone who uses firearms for their employment or other work purposes could continue to have their applications partly funded. Basque Scotland raised concerns that the enhanced costs brought about by a two-tier system would deter recreational shooters who contribute significantly to the rural economy. Basque says the current system overwhelmingly works well and the introduction of increased application fees will do nothing further to improve public safety. A Devon MP is calling for fox hunting to be banned as he calls it fully 
Luke Pollard, MP for Sutton and Devonport, wants what he describes as loopholes associated with trail hunting to end. He claims that hunts kill hundreds of foxes across the UK. He offers no proof for this accusation. A new study reveals that Scotland wastes £100,000 protecting red squirrels from grey squirrels where the alien invader doesn't even exist. Timber forests with red squirrel populations currently have to take special protection measures during felling work. New research and a five-year study of red squirrel behaviour shows that conservation efforts targeting the species needs a rethink. A report from Forestry and Land Scotland finds that many of the restrictions are in areas that don't have grey squirrels. The report also finds that red squirrels aren't threatened by timber forests and often thrive in them. Scottish Greens claim that hunts on royal land are protected by a loophole in the new Scottish Anti-Hunting Bill. It's as a result of a special exclusion written into the power sharing agreement underpinning the current government. Police officers can't go on King Charles' private land, such as his Balmoral estate, without his permission. The Greens claim this could be exploited for hunting and add it is particularly galling because of the long historic links between the aristocracy and hunting. BBC TV presenter Chris Packham is urging people to feed foxes. The anti-supporter admits he feeds the animals, although he claims he doesn't allow them onto his patio. The broadcaster says people need to be careful about their interaction with foxes and avoid feeding them just to secure a close encounter. Packham says he puts food out for foxes in woods near his home in Hampshire so as to avoid the animals associating humans with food. Sweden's biggest wolf cull in modern times is underway. 200 hunters are out until the end of January to shoot 75 wolves out of a population of 460. The government is seeking to reduce pack densities. The Swedish Hunters Association says hunting is the best way to slow the growth. Sweden shares a wolf population with Norway along its border. Antis in Norway are fighting the cull and a court hearing this week will determine if it can go ahead. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. A walrus that prompted the cancellation of New Year fireworks at an English seaside resort had already swum off. The animal, nicknamed Thor, attracted a crowd in the hundreds in Scarborough. They were all kept from approaching the animal by the police. The same animal had earlier visited the Netherlands, France and Hampshire. Scarborough Council cancelled the fireworks in order not to frighten the animal. By the time midnight on New Year's Eve struck, the walrus was already heading 70 miles north to Blythe and is now thought to be swimming north back to the Arctic. And finally, the London Dungeons is banning vegans during Veganuary. The tourist attraction, which features exhibitions of grisly and macabre characters, says it's taking the action in support of one of its most popular exhibits. Mrs Lovett, the pie maker of Fleet Street, partner of Grizzly Barber and serial killer Sweeney Todd. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. buying shooting kits then head to kit finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the uk kit finder the shooting kit comparison website Now, Dave, the dog Templar, is out training a Cocker Spaniel for field trials. Here is his latest top tip for flushing and picking up. We are at the Neston Park shoot outside Bath, and Dave Templar is training a Cocker Spaniel for field trials. He is walking up a cover crop with the wind behind him. That means the flush can take both dog and gun by surprise. Well done, gamekeeper Seb, for knocking it down. For the retrieve, however, the wind direction produces new difficulties and heavy use of the whistle, for which Dave beats himself up afterwards. It overtook it because I'm marking where it hit the ground. The dog's marking where it hit the ground. If you look at this cover, it all looks the same, flat piece of paper. Dog's down a lot lower than we are, so he's just marking the arc. And then when it hits the ground, he has to overtake it to smell it. I panicked a little bit, 
So as he went past it, I stopped him and then brought him back onto it. But actually, I stopped him knowing where it is. I told him that when I blow that stop whistle, it's thereabouts. So he came back on the wind. So it's actually teaching yourself to sometimes calm down. So they realise that actually it is a back wind. Let's work it. We tend to rush on and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a weird thing because of the way the cover is. How long does it take Dave to put his dog on the next bird? The answer is 40 years. It's Dave's 40 years of experience that means he can find that next bird. Where are the birds going to be? Well, if you turn around there, there's an oak tree. And there's loads of acorns come off of it. If I was a pheasant, I'd be underneath that tree. I came here running a competition the other day and I thought I was going to flush a bird at the base of that tree. And then I realised there's a lightning tree and there's nothing in it, right? Whereas if it was an oak tree, you'd walk up to it. You go into a bare wood, look under a holly bush. There's usually a cockbird under a holly bush. It's dry, they've been digging away at it. So what you're doing is using that 40 years of game sense, I suppose, that I, you know, I've managed to be able to shoot everywhere and whatever. And that gives you a slight advantage. If you see the best people, they know how to judge the ground. Knowing where the bird is, is one thing. For field trial purposes, it's all about showing that the dog does the work. All the time you're trying to get the dog to keep quarter and turning, so he has to start to listen to the whistle. Now, I myself, I tend to rush quite a little lot. I should calm down. It's terrible. I enjoy running in them. It's a bit like racing a Ferrari, so I get the adrenaline rush out of it. Whereas I should slow down, because actually the wind is coming slightly from behind us. And if you watch the dog at times, it goes out a little bit and it starts to come back, and I really should stand still. Well, I'd have been happy with that flush and retrieve, but for field trials, you have to be a perfectionist. For more about Dave's training and breeding, visit countrywaysgundogs.com. Thank you, Dave. Next, with the driven pheasant season winding down, thoughts turn to breeding next year's birds. With bird flu still stalking the nation, how's that going? The outbreak is still continuing, but it has improved significantly from where we were a couple of months ago. Throughout October, we were running at about 21 outbreaks a week on average. That dropped to 14 in November, and we've had four outbreaks uh, in this week and four outbreaks in the previous week. So the rate of new infections is coming down, but uh, we're still not out of the woods yet. This game farm in Worcestershire is trying to take no chances with bird flu. Washing boots, nets covering open pens. It's overwintering more than 100,000 pheasants. Paul Jevons is also the president of the Game Farmers Association. Even though he has his own birds, he still needed to buy eggs in 2022 for his game farm and was gazumped. The one probably good thing that came out of Avon Flu was that we managed to share the risk with our customers. We got customers to buy their own eggs so they knew how much they were paying from Spain. And so they knew the costs uh, and they could calculate into their shoot costs. But it was almost a perfect storm because there was gazumping, profiteering, we were coming out of coronavirus, we had Brexit, we had the Ukrainian problems, so all our costs were, were unbelievable. Adam Gwillem runs three commercial shoots, but he can only operate two this season as he couldn't source partridge eggs or chicks. His business normally puts on 100 days in a season across the three shoots. This year it will be 55 days across two shoots. It obviously impacted our clients as well with increased price per, per bird for shooting. But generally we, we have managed to survive quite well. Shooting quality has been good and numbers of birds have been good. It, the problems that we have found are that we've had to isolate those numbers that we have managed to get in certain areas of the shoot, which has meant that shooting pressure has been an issue as we've got through the season. Businesses are advised to be cautiously optimistic for this year. I think there's cautious optimism. Uh, we've learned an awful lot this year. We've come through a terrible outbreak. Uh, there's been a huge impact on the sector, but we've survived. We're still shooting and we're looking forward to next year with, as I say, cautious optimism. There have been some improvements to the disease control measures that the government uh, puts in place. We've had some positive changes to the way the compensation scheme works. We've had uh, changes to the definition of what constitutes poultry and what doesn't. So the type of disease control measures that are employed. So a lot of backyard flocks now are being treated differently to how they were being treated a year ago. Paul's pheasant eggs are incubated and hatched on site in their own hatchery. They also rear a similar number of partridges, 
all from chicks hatched in their own hatchery from eggs bought in from French suppliers. Paul has already ordered 50% of next season's partridge eggs from Spain to reduce the risk of being wholly dependent on France. He's optimistic for the 2023 season. Well, we did a sort of planning a year ago. We thought if we can't rear any pheasants due to uh, avian flu, uh, that we could perhaps just do partridges. We don't seem so susceptible. And we'd probably do 30% less birds if we only did partridge. We've, we've got all the equipment if we need to do that. But I'm very pleased at the moment there seem to be less cases of avian flu about. So we're going to go for it. Despite the challenges of bird flu in 2022, Dominic believes this year will be brighter. We are cautiously optimistic that vaccines will be a realistic possibility in the next few years. Uh, that situation was not the case 12 months ago. So we have reasons to be optimistic about the future, but there's no doubt that there is still the potential for us to have a few tough years ahead of us before we get to the point where vaccines are in everyday use, for example, if that comes to pass, and we'll have to wait and see. There are less cases about, and, and I think even though we've got it in Worcester a few miles away, it doesn't seem to have spread any further. I, I don't really get it. it. It all seems to be about stocking rates and ages of birds. As a game rearer, I'm not worried about rearing them. Uh, I do feel that very highly stocked release pens later in the autumn uh, in wet areas of the country are at a higher risk. We've had um, a number of difficult years over the last three, three years with COVID and then the COVID recovery year and then, then to be slapped with bird flu issues this year is has been difficult but um, we are we're very hopeful and determined to to provide hopefully the our best season yet for the latest on bird flu and information on the current restrictions see the link below thanks deborah heartening news for next season now from birds to the best hunting and shooting films on youtube brought to you by james marchington it is hunting youtube This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up this week, ignore the clickbait title and jump right in. This is a brilliantly produced film from a popular food channel about hunting a buffalo and cooking up a feast for the local village. Meanwhile, Joseph Carter the Mink Man has a hectic hour with his dogs in a rat-infested shed, finishing with a bag of over 500. TGS Outdoors have released episode 2 of their Top Gear-style gun review series. This time they shoot a variety of Rimfire rifles, and Johnny has to take a dunk in a cattle trough. Rob Speed is on a driven shoot in the Quantock Hills and is chuffed to shoot a white pheasant, landing his neighbouring gun with a £20 fine. Next up, the Jack Pike team visit Paul Childerley in Bedfordshire. Not only is Paul a legendary squirrel wrangler, it seems he can put on a stunning driven duck day too. Simon 6 PPC has a sleepless night trying to get the better of a particularly cunning fox that's raiding the farmer's duck pond. It slips by him on the way out, but will he catch it on the way back? Here's some impressive shooting from a hide. Nitro HV in Northern Ireland is making a good bag of hooded crows with his 1-7 Hornet. And finally, the latest from dog photographer Nick Ridley and his GoPro having a great day's rough shooting over his cocker spaniels. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.